This video is part 2 of my Surtologist plan theory. If you have not watched part 1, please do so before watching this video as it contains very much needed context. Part 1 is linked in the cards, the description and the pinned comment. Last time we talked a lot about Surtology destroying and recreating Tevat, but we still haven't found an answer to the most important question. Why would he do any of that in the first place? Honestly, the answer is quite straightforward. He wants to defy fate. Literally every single character that we know to be related to Surtology in any way is associated with fate in some way, shape or form. Fate is mentioned in every single drop from the Narwhal, not to mention that we got to learn about the Fowl in Fontaine's chapter, whose main theme is the subversion of fate. On top of that, when Skirk learned that we didn't know who her master was, she dropped two more names of people that are related to him in some way to try and joke up some memories. And those two names were Verdolfnir, the visionary, and Rhine daughter, Gold. Verdolfnir is a completely new name, while Gold is a mysterious and unseen but old acquaintance of ours. According to Skirk, both Rhine daughter and Sertology are searching for some kind of perfection, but she did not elaborate. We do know, however, that Gold is obsessed with creating artificial life. Perfect artificial life. Which is why she discarded the results of her first attempt at a primordial human project, otherwise known as Sasbedo. This ambition to perfect life is likely shared by Surtology, just in a different way, but we will get to that. For now, what really matters is that both of these people are intrinsically linked to Ermensel. Rhine daughter because she's a witch who is part of Hexenzirkel. Hexenzirkel as a whole is said to conduct excursions to Ermensel. Among them there is also Nicole, who is connected to the tree in such a way that she knows when it is altered. We also have Barbaloth, the Trice's great hydromancer and astrologer whose expertise is divining fate. Having this in mind, it seems impossible for Gold to not also be connected to the tree and have knowledge about fate itself, especially because she assigned Albedo to find out the infamous truth of this world. How can she grade that assignment if she does not know the answer herself? As for Verdolfnir, this is a name stemming from Norse mythology. Specifically, it refers to a hawk that sits between the eyes of an unnamed eagle, which in turn sits atop the world tree. The purpose of this hawk is not really known, but scholars hypothesize that, considering it sits between the eyes, this bird may represent the wisdom of the eagle, which is said to know a great many things. It's possible its role was also to fly off in search of more knowledge, just like Odin's ravens were said to do. Whatever the case, the world tree has a counterpart in Genshin, Ermensul, and Verdolfnir probably being associated with knowledge in some way seems to indicate that they too possess knowledge about Ermensul. And we might actually have seen Surtology being represented in-game in association with Ermensul before. You see, there was this Sumeru trailer that ended with a shot of Totore being a maniac, as per usual, while Ermensul burns. This never happened in the Sumeru arc. Nothing even came close to it. But Surtolog in Norse mythology is the fire that will burn the world during Ragnarok. I wonder if his existence in Genshin was seized all that time ago and we never even noticed. And to burn Ermensul is to burn fate. I swear that Nahida is a patron saint of all lore enjoyers, because even during the Fontaine arc she came in clutch with a voice line that confirms that fate is carved into Ermensul. It does not simply record information from the past, it also dictates the future, which clears up some things in regards to the Narwhal. After all, it seems very illogical for a creature that hails from beyond the Sea of Stars and has no allegiance to Celestia to be the one to kickstart the prophecy and thus deliver Celestial Judgment. And I don't believe this was the original plan. After all, fate is only the future as seen by the gods, but they have blind spots. I don't think Celestia can predict exactly how things will unfold. They mustn't have been expecting the Narwhal, which is why we see no allusion to it in the stone slates detailing the prophecy. But for a tree, Ermensul is surprisingly flexible. If you alter the data it has to work with, it will preserve the outcome by making tweaks whatever they are needed. Well, that sounded confusing. Uh, think about it like this. When Scaramouche raised himself, Ermensul retconned everything about his existence, but it cannot alter the past. So instead, it altered the memories of the people in the present as well as any physical records that implicate his existence. The manuscript of the story of Kunikuzushi was completely changed to not include him at all. And instead, an alternative explanation was given to justify what happened in the Tarasuna with Niwa and company. The same happened with Ruka Devata. All mentions of her were erased and the credit for everything she did for her people was transferred to Nahida. 
This tells us that Ermin's soul has the ability to patch up any holes left in the narrative by the removal of information, and it probably can do the same when you add information, as is the case of the narwhal. It wasn't supposed to be in Tevat, and it definitely wasn't supposed to be feeding on the primordial sea, but it was. And because Erminsol was programmed to make Fontaine's prophecy come true, it simply added the narwhal into its calculations and turned it into the harbinger of the flood. So, this tells us two things. One, it is possible to alter fate. The narwhal did it by intruding into the prophecy, and fossil lore did it to a greater extent by breaking said prophecy. And two, it is very hard to alter fate in any significant way. Think about it as safety points in the timeline. Small changes in the narrative are not sufficient to alter these points, and as long as they remain intact, what comes after will not be impacted. Only by disrupting these points can you have a significant impact on how the future unfolds. And I think that is exactly what Surtelorj is struggling with. Remember how last time I said that he probably had a plan A that had failed? This is it. So let's talk about all the small, ultimately inconsequential ways in which Surtology has altered fate. Hoyo is very fond of using this glass-breaking effect, not just in Genshin, but while in Honkai Star Rail it seems to be associated with memories, in Genshin I would argue it represents the alteration of fate and the destruction of the order heavenly principles established. Actually, I will say that those two things are probably one and the same. Thanks to Nuvolet's vision character story, we now know for sure that Heavenly Principles isn't doing too hot. But even when they were still in possession of their absolute authority, they were still struggling with the original order of this world, which must be referring to the unique rules of Tevat, which in turn might have been established by the sovereigns as when together they had complete authority over the mortal realm. You know, before they got robbed in their own house, the audacity. And in fact, Nuvolet's fifth character story confirms this. He does not have a true constellation, because fate is merely the manner in which the present ruler of this world plays with living beings. His words, not mine. He describes constellations as celestial puppet strings, which is an apt description because constellations seem to function in the same way prophecies do. They are true invisible puppet strings, because even when you purposely try to go against them, you are unknowingly playing into your role just like what happened with the trial that put the prophecy into motion when it was meant to stop it altogether. Constellations are also carved into Erminsul. Actually, I would go so far as to say that constellations are Erminsul's fruits. I'm like 99% sure of this, because all constellations follow the patterns laid out by the teleport waypoints found in Tevat. Seriously, you can check it out, there is a perfect match every time, and often a character's earthly constellation is located somewhere that is significant to them, like the place where they live or where an important event occurs. All teleport waypoints are connected to the ley lines, which in turn are connected to Erminsul. As above, so below. The sky and Tevat mirror each other perfectly. This is the order that Heavenly Principles established. The eggshell may serve a double purpose. It might act as a shield to keep aliens out of Tevat and perhaps to prevent Tevatians from leaving, but it is also a way to physically weave fate into the world. What if I told you that the puppet strings Nuvolat mentioned have a double meaning? What if I told you that the quote-unquote teleport waypoint constellations and the actual constellations in the sky are physically connected to each other by the strings of fate. And King Remus of Remuria knew about this a long time ago. That's why he was obsessed with music. He wanted to create a harmonious symphony of prosperity. He essentially wanted his music to harmonize with the tune of fate, believing that would spare Remuria from destruction. He wanted to pluck the strings of fate. I guess you could imagine fate as a giant harp, which is interesting because Venti, who claims to know all songs, past and future, is also a harp player. And the music that plays in the loading screen that displays Celestia? That's played on a harp too. So when someone alters fate, they physically damage the strings or the eggshell, which suddenly makes one of the drops of the narwhal make a lot more sense. Allow me to read you the description of Lightless Silk String. A slender strand that somehow ended up entangled on your weapon while fighting the all-devouring narwhal. In ancient Fontaine, some thought that Fortuna, which ruled the world, was woven from countless fibers, like the strings of a harp. 
Strings that resonate with the majestic music would bring happiness to all, while discord would destroy the fabric of the universe. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. So, back to screen cracks. They seem to represent the destruction of the strings and the eggshell as I was saying, because this effect only appears when fate is altered. The most obvious case was when the screen cracked immediately after we defeated the narwhal. Skirk claimed that the roiling hydro energies resulting from the battle would be hard for the planet's deep seas to digest. That was why the flood happened. Defeating the narwhal made the waters rise and the moment they made contact with the Fontanians, nothing happened. Up until this point, the prophecy had been followed to a T. All the events depicted in the stone slates came to pass. This was the first time things did not go according to the script. It was a moment when fate was changed. A very significant change, but the credits for this one go to Fossilor. The narwhal was just a pawn, so for Certology this isn't much of a win over fate. We also saw the sky crack at the end of Nuvolet's trailer, where he implies he's moving on to challenging heavenly principles, so in this case we see the eggshell cracking as an omen for the destruction of Celestial Order. But there is another much older screen cracking game that spoiled part of Fontaine's arc all the way back in 1.0. In Child's trailer, we see the screen crack over his vision and its light dims as a result. He told us that the power within him is getting restless, so it seemed like he was suggesting the power of the abyss that dwells inside him was responsible for the vision malfunctioning, but I don't believe this to be the case. I mean, during his boss fight he is capable of using hydro attacks in his foul legacy form. If there is a moment when his power becomes restless, it would be when he is transformed, but that wasn't enough to put his vision out of commission. And also, even though the whale is linked to the abyss, it is not abyssal in nature. I'm unsure to which extent it would even be able to increase the abyssal power within child. Rather, I think this was all a result of the whale's ability to alter fate. Remember, all the drops mention fate and it literally tears apart the strings. Celestia seems to be harvesting vision wielders in some way and for some reason, but before they can do that, an allergy needs to fulfill their duty. Now, visions don't come with an instruction manual, no goals are set for their owners to achieve, so this duty must be tied to their fate, which is determined by their constellation. Meeting with the whale for a second time might have changed Child's fate, jeopardizing his ability to fulfill his duty. Thus, the vision stopped working as intended. That's another point for Certology for indirectly changing fate, but I don't think this was the first time the whale changed Tartalia's fate. In fact, it might have changed his entire constellation back when he was 14. His constellation is named Monoceros Kaylee, literally Sky Whale. But it feels really weird to have this entire fate be dictated by something that does not even belong to Tevat, which leads me to believe that this is not his birth constellation. Now, I know that Mona claims that she can read the fate of vision wielders in the stars, but I do not believe they are the only ones with a constellation. Leonard doesn't appear to have had a vision, yet he still had a constellation. But also, Nuvolet says that the usurper uses fate to play with their living beings, not just humans, so most life forms must be controlled by fate to some degree at least. All this to say that humans and other sentient beings are probably already born with a constellation, and Child seems to prove that he can change it. The Wanderer is just further proof. There is no way that this current constellation was with him from the start when he erased all that he was from Ermensol. The current one must have been attributed to him post erasure because the tree recognized him as a new Tevatin being. Think about it. Let's say that you are the one who wants to defy fate and you know that everyone is bound by a constellation that dictates their fate. Wouldn't the first step be to try and get rid of said constellations? And Surtology seems to have the power to do just that. I did say that the whale changed child's fate and I'm sure that is true to some degree, but Surtology might have had a far more direct intervention because Tartalia has been carrying his name this entire time. Foul Legacy is the name of his abyssal form, and Surtology's title is the Foul. Child learned this power from Skirk, who learned it from Surtology. This power is abyssal in nature, while constellations are celestial, and we all know that Celestia and the Abyss do not mix. 
Just like how Nibelung believed that forbidden knowledge was needed to defeat heavenly principles, Surtology may also believe the power of the Void Realm is the key to defeating fate. And perhaps that is why so many creatures associated with the Abyss possess star patterns in their design, like Child, Dainsliff, Paimon, Dvalin while afflicted by corruption, Guizhong for some reason. Side note, but this is a perfect time to remind you that Mona cannot even catch a glimpse of Paimon's fate, so she might not have a true constellation at all. Anyway, we might have been thinking about it wrong this whole time, though. Maybe the stars aren't a sign of the abyss, but of fate and the desire to change it. After all, Fossilor also has it and her entire 500 year long existence as a god had one purpose, to defy the fate assigned to her people. But there is another large group of beings that sport the same pattern. The Abyssal Monsters. Heralds, Lectors, Baptists, Black Serpent Knights. They all have stars somewhere in their design. In some they are more obvious than in others, but they are always there. You may or may not remember it, but in part 1 I mentioned that Surtology likely took a lot of humans under his wing, not just Child and possibly Skirk. And this is exactly what I am talking about because we have still not been told where these monsters come from, only that most of them seem to have been Conrian. We do know that two curses were cast on inhabitants of the underground nation. Mixed-blooded Conrians and people of other nations got turned into trolls, while pure-blooded Conrians were given immortality. Which does not explain why Tevite is suddenly crawling with monsters other than trolls. So what is going on in here? Is this a third curse? Were some Conrians simply more involved with the Abyss and thus turned into monsters? Was it Gold's doing? Well, no. I would say it was actually Surtology's doing. After all, doesn't Child's foul legacy transformation look a lot like these monsters? And the same goes for the shadow that protects a narwhal from the inside. That one is totally Surtology's doing, I mean it's protecting his pet. Moreover, the timeline for the creation of these monsters is really weird, because by the time we met Kothar, we must have been a couple centuries removed from the Cataclysm. If you consider the fact that Carrie Bear was incredibly weak due to erosion and that his father was starting to lose it. And yet it was during that meeting with the sibling that Clothar saw his very first herald, which is odd. You would think that if this was some sort of curse, it would have taken effect immediately alongside the other two, so Clothar would have seen people turn into these monsters in front of his eyes. Ok, but let's say that for some reason this one had a delayed onset. Well, no, that's not it, and we know that because of Tainsliff. Yes, I am talking about him again, no, I am not addicted, I can stop whenever I want, I just don't want to. Zurvan met Dane during the Cataclysm. It was still going on. And by that time, half his body had already turned into that of a monster, while the other half remains human to this day. And you see, the thing about Dane was that he was really angry at some point. In true Conrian fashion, he really didn't like the gods. Well, he still doesn't, but he was also really determined to change fate. He claims to have knowledge about it and to have, at some point, wished to take it into his own hands. That desire, however, is long gone. And this change of heart might have been what halted his transformation. Granted, his ring might have had something to do with that. I've talked about that before, actually, but hear me out for now. We have established that Surtology seems to want to oppose fate and that he has, indirectly, granted child a form that is highly resembling of the ones the Abyssal Monsters took on. We have also discussed how one's constellation dictates their fate and how it is of celestial origins and therefore incompatible with abyssal power. Now we have Dane, who wished to change fate, started turning into one of these monsters, changed his mind at some point and halted his transformation. Do you see what I am getting at? Clothar, who very much was about changing fate, what with him celebrating Carrie Bear becoming the loom of fate, instinctually felt that the herald he met that day was a perfect creature, something greater than a human, something more… evolved? If you read the description of the consecrated beasts, you will see that they used to be regular animals that fed on higher elemental life forms and evolved as a result. The parts they could not digest were turned into an exoskeleton of swords which the abyssal monsters also seemed to have. It honestly looks like they are wearing armor. So, assuming they went through a similar process, what would be evolution in their case? 
the ability to wield elements, check, but there is one thing they are constantly blabbing about, truth and just straight up fate. Seriously, how many times have you heard, the truth shall set you free, a glimpse of the future, the fate of this world is already sealed. Clothar's Herald straight up tells us that fate did not grant us permission to be there. So on one hand, you have fate, which essentially behaves like puppet strings, and on the other, we have this truth that can set you free from that control, from that fate. So this transformation of these beings seems to revolve all around breaking free from their fate their constellation. Which, have you ever noticed that the Spiral Abyss is just full of constellations, from lone stars to constellations with two, three, four or five stars, but never six, never a full constellation. We know that the physical stars in the sky can fall for one reason or another, but we have also discussed how the ley lines mirror those stars, and storing information is their whole deal, so there must be an energetical counterpart to the rocks in the sky, and these things would be it. They are blue, after all, which might as well be Celestia's signature. Blue is the color of the energy beam that the statues of the seven shoot up into the sky. It's the color of the celestial nails and even the inside of Ermensol. These constellations are Celestia's doing, and so is fate. Moreover, it seems like they are floating up and out of the spiral abyss, but the whole thing is upside down. After all, the stairs after each stage lead up, but we descend further with each passing level. So, in truth, this blue power is pouring down into the spiral abyss, almost like it's falling from Ermensol. The abyssal monsters are tainted by the abyss, which naturally counters Slash's power, leading their constellations to break down, setting them free from fate. These little stars? They may be the constellations that the abyssal monsters shed. Are you still not sold on this being Surtologist is doing? Let me drag Jacob into the fray. He is a neo-human who obtained his abilities thanks to Rene's help. He is a creature that can take on his original human form, but can also transform into an iniquitous Baptist. This ability is not unique to him, and you can also take on a human form. It's probable they are not exceptions. This is an important detail, so keep it in mind. Despite the similarities he shares with them, though, Jacob despises the Abyss Order. He calls them benighted primitives that are trying to manipulate a power very few can use. Benighted means ignorant. It appears that Jacob is claiming that the Abyss Order knows very little about the power that made them what they are, so they mustn't have been the ones to acquire it, meaning they required external help. On the other hand, Dean Slip immediately turning into a monster while Clother had no idea such beings existed suggests that not all of them got transformed at once, which supports the idea of someone else going around lending a helping hand. And Surtologi just happens to have a track record when it comes to creating these kinds of creatures. And also, the Pyro-aligned Lecter says, from the ashes, to this world anew. Which could just be a pun about fire, but Surtologi is the fire that will burn the world and it seems to be trying to remake Tivat anew. So is this just a lector that loves dad jokes, or a creature boasting about his creator? Who knows? As of right now, I would say it's either Surtologi or the Sinner, since there was a herald protecting the crystal. Unless... they are one and the same, since Dane knows the Sinner very well, huh? Huh? I am only partially kidding, but that is a speculation for another day when we have more info. Okay, so moving on, if Surtology wants to defeat fate and if the Abyssal Monsters manage to shed their constellations, he has succeeded, right? But in part 1 I told you that his plan A failed, so what's up with that? Well, you know how I said the constellations in the Spiral Abyss are never complete? I don't think these monsters have managed to completely free themselves from fate, and that's because they are not monsters at all. They are very much still human. It looks like they are wearing armor and they can still assume a human-like form, but most importantly, they die like humans. Humanity is one of Slash's creations and so the gods also left their signature on them. When a human dies, their body dissolves into these blue particles which return to the ley lines and return to Ermensol. The very thing responsible for enacting fate. Monsters like Heliochurls release red particles upon their death, whose color resembles the power of the Sustainer. 
A lot of people hypothesize that the curse was meant to keep them out of the ley lines. Well, judging by the color, it worked. But the lectors, the heralds, they also dissipate into these blue particles. So how could they have truly broken free from fate? Now, there is a subset of these beings that dissolve into this dark purple color, the same color exhibited by the mud in the chasm, which is just modified abyssal power, so they must be out of Ormansel's cycle, but at a high price. I'm talking about the Black Serpent Knights. These ones are just far gone. You can have a totally logical conversation with a lector or a herald, because their minds are intact. Black Serpent Knights, however, are far more similar to Hillichurls. They are driven forward by a need to fight for someone, to protect, because that is all they have left from their days as members of the Condrian Royal Guard. According to Dainsliff, they have lost their intellect. When they have degraded enough, they are known as Shadowy Husks, which honestly tells you everything you need to know about them. They are no longer human. The only exception we know of is Half then. His mind was clouded, but there, and when he died, his soul was still very much blue, leyline bound. So it seems that you can either lose your humanity or remain bound to fate to some degree. This might tie back to Erminsel's flexibility. If it could grant child and skirmish brand new constellations, a lot of abyssal power might be needed to completely sever its grip on someone, and abyssal power is highly corruptive, even to abyssal creatures. This is why Plan A failed. Surtology cannot save humanity from fate if, in order to free them, they have to lose their humanity. But why does he care? Why does he want them to keep their humanity? Actually, scratch that. Why would he want to save humans in the first place? That's an easy question, actually. He wants an army. Breaking free from fate is not the same as defeating Celestia. They wouldn't just stand idly by, he needs firepower to deal with them. Pun fully intended, the Pyrolector would be so proud. Don't you think it's weird that Celestia was so mad at Egeria for creating new humans? It's not like she was the first god to create new life forms. I mean, Rukad Vata had her Aranara, Nabu Malikata had Simurg, and the two of them plus Egeria created a party. But you don't see any prophecies clamoring for the destruction of those beings, even though they are also sentient. They were also shielded with Egeria creating Oshinids, so long as they remained as Oshinids. So what is so special about humans? And why is Slash is so apparently terrified of them? Because it's not only the Fondanians. The Celestial Gods always went through great pains to make sure humanity did not learn too much, even when they were in direct contact. Then, Celestia went to buy milk and shut down communication, but they established the Order of Seven instead so that there was always someone to keep an eye on the humans. And every time one of them shows great promise, they are gifted a vision which allows them to be harvested in some way down the road. That smells like fear to me. And maybe they have a very good reason to be afraid. Nabu Malikata was a silly. She was created by the Primordial One. She knew their power firsthand. She even applauded Rukadvata for recognizing that one simply could not escape the rule of heavenly principles. And yet, she willingly went against them when she helped Deshret. She laid down her life to do so. Clearly, she believed in whatever she was doing. And before her sacrifice, she said, Upon the tombstone of divinity shall humanity become the god of gods. Such a carefree dream was certain to be unmade. In ruins where lies are sundered, humanity will become the king of kings. Humanity might just be worth a lot more than anyone bargained for. And Surtology's lot just really values strength. Both Child and Skark have made that abundantly clear. If there is so much potential in humanity, you would think Surtology would want to make it flourish, so any plans that revolve around them losing their humanity are a no-go. His idea of perfection may be incredibly human after all, which leaves him with plan B, recreate Tivat within the Narwhal so that the tapestry of fate won't exist at all. That wraps it up, but before you go, I want to talk about something real quick because I don't know where else to fit it into. Have you ever wondered why Conria is named, well, Conria? At this point, I don't think we know the origins of this name for sure, but the consensus seems to be that it stems from Arabic, and the translation most people settle on seems to be Wind Betrayers. 
I am side-eyeing Kaya so hard right now. Our wannabe pirate aside, this is odd. The nation had beef with gods in general, no need for them to target Barbata specifically when they could just go for Slush instead. Go big or go home on knowledge ass. But even though Istaroth is connected to wind, this element is not synonymous with the abode of the gods at all. So what could this mean? While researching Ragnarok, I found something interesting. Asiras predicted that the children of the surviving gods would widely inhabit the windy world. Because remember, Ragnarok isn't the end of the gods. But Kanria wants to put an end to the gods. This could be a direct reference to them not wanting Slashy to keep its grip on Devat, but also, since Surtology may be the one to kickstart Ragnarok, and Sissi may be trying to create a new Tevat, none of Conria's children would remain to inhabit the original Windy One. Just a thought. So, this script really got away from me. I didn't want to make another super long video, said Past Blue, while well, Past Blue was a fool. What do you think? Is this what Surtology is doing? Did he create Abyssal Monsters, or rather, Abyssal Humans? And honestly, do you think he could be the sinner? I'm really interested on that one. Anyway, I have been slowly but progressively losing my voice during this recording, so I'm so sorry about that. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please consider subscribing and sharing the video because this took way too long. My name is Blue and I'll see you again soon. Safe journey, travelers!